Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I will be your Gaming Monk for the evening. Some of you may recall last year I did a semi-review called Sayonara D&D, my intended parting shot to D&D 5th edition. While I've bent my no-talking statement a little bit, I've endeavored to keep my coverage of the world's most popular role-playing game, allegedly, to a minimum and only invoke it when absolutely necessary. I have also talked about several alternatives that could fill this particular niche. As of this recording, I've covered two of them in Heroes Against Darkness and 13th Age. Today, we'll be touching upon another one in the list, Unchained Heroes. This is where we break the trend in the D&D alternatives that I've covered, as most of them were somewhat light on crunch. In this case, we have a game that emphasizes crunch and tactical play through resource management as opposed to map management. How does it hold up? Well, let's find out. Unchained Heroes runs at 353 pages, and can best be described as dense. While it's not hard to read with the color variation and a strong use of font, I call it dense because it comes across wanting to get the most text on a given page in a time. Normally that's not an issue, but I feel some breather pages could have helped with the book's flow, even if it might increase the total page count by a few. While the inclusion of an index is appreciated, this game is one of the rare times where I think a glossary is advisable as well. It's a rough start, all things considered. Character creation leans on the more crunchy side of things, which we'll be exploring in our sample fighter, Victor Yizark. First, primary attributes. As a traditionalist, I'm going to be using method 3 and roll 4d6 six times, dropping the lowest result each time. In this, we rolled an 18, 17, two 16s, a 14, and a 12. This makes his primary attributes strength 4, agility 3, Stamina 3, Intellect 1, Cunning 2, and Spirit 3. Second is Class. Given how we'll be doing the Swordsman archetype, we'll be going with Warrior, which determines our combat gear, talents, techniques, and battle skills. Third is Resource Pools. The three resources here are Health, Energy, and Tactical Points. Health is determined by adding the primary attribute times 10, plus 3d6 as Champion, along with a base of 100. Since we rolled 14 on a roll bonus, Victor's health is 154. Energy is generated similarly, but without the die roll. In this case, we have 140. And finally, tactical points, which start at 0 and have a cap of 10. Fourth is character skills. We have a number of ranks to spend equal to 8 plus our intellect or cunning, in which case we'll go with cunning, totaling 10 points. We assign points on this on the following ranks. Athletics 2, Crafting 2, Education 1, Medicine 1, Natural Lore 1, and Perception 3. Fifth concerns abilities, talents, and techniques. Abilities are the powers and techniques granted by class, while talents are utility-like effects that mostly play a factor outside of combat, and techniques are a ranked series of passive benefits. While most of these are designed based on class, we may choose one additional entry from each that we qualify for. Of these three, we'll go with the Sword and Board ability, the Legionnaire Talent, and the Tactician Technique. Sixth is Species. For this instance, we'll be going with Human, granting us the Accomplice, Competitive Spirit, and Quick Thinking advantages. In addition, we gain a plus one modifier to one attribute, in this case Intellect, bringing that up to two. Furthermore, the Competitive Spirit advantage grants us an additional technique, which we'll put in Deadliness. Seventh is Battle Skills, of which there are four. Attack, Defense, Power, and Willpower. These have a starting rank based on the chosen class, and two additional ranks can be added. In our case, we'll be putting them into attack and defense. Character creation appears crunchy, but in practice it's a little less so. I do think that synergy could have been better established in abilities, and I do like the variety of build, as well as how the game avoids skill traps in other fantasy games. But this is going to be a tricky affair depending on your gaming background. I do wish that things like abilities, talents, and techniques were better organized by subcategory instead of alphabetically. It kind of reminds me of the feat organization problems in D&D 3rd edition, although nowhere near as extreme. Unchained Heroes uses a standard D20 roll versus a target number. That's where the similarities end. While aspects like skills might be familiar, once combat begins, any similarities to D20 get thrown out the window. 
starting with turns and the battlefield. For starters, Unchained Heroes uses a turn system called the Real-Time Combat Engine, as opposed to the standard initiative count. While initiative rolls do happen at the start of an encounter, this is only to determine order for the first round and to resolve any tiebreakers, if any. Every action in the game has a value known as action time, along a grid of time intervals. This determines how long it takes for the action to initiate. For those of you who are familiar with active time systems like those seen in Final Fantasy or Grandia, or the ticks in the Storyteller system used in Exalted and World of Darkness, you'll find yourselves on familiar ground here. The main difference is that there's no soft reset. Action times add up on the time interval based on the declared action. In addition, actions that are resolved instantly have the price of adding action time to make up for moving so quickly. Effectively, this makes time itself a resource, but not one that can be hoarded. The battlefield is the other way that encounters are tactical without relying on a grid. Instead of using the typical dungeon or hex map, Unchained Heroes uses a set of broad sections known as battle zones for placement. This means that specific ranges aren't as much of a factor as in other games. Instead of flanking, battle zone control is utilized, wherein the side that has more combatants grants a slight bonus to rolls. Furthermore, area of effect type abilities are far less situational. Movement is also one zone per action, but has an action time of, at most, 13. Less depending on the character's build. Combat in Unchained Heroes is tactical, but is tactical of a different sort. While positioning is important, the bulk of tactics available is rooted in managing your energy and tactical points, the latter consumed by a series of abilities that will be exclusive to each class, and the former your power pool of active abilities. While I initially raised my eyebrow at the lack of an equivalent to advanced classes, or something similar, I've come to realize that the game makes up for this with each class's versatility. Speaking of which... In a manner similar to 4th edition's roles, classes and unchained heroes fall under one of three broad archetypes, champion for the Flatline fighters, sentinels acting as support, and vanguards dealing direct damage. The first class, alchemist, is a sentinel type not too far removed from the alchemist you might see in Pathfinder. In the same vein, they have a lot of grenade-like abilities at their disposal, but what's important with their strategies is a sense of synergy. Clerics, also a sentinel, is one of the more diverse classes based on its three paths, Abyssal, Ascension, and Balance. Every cleric ability is tied to one of these three paths, and a cleric starting pool will have one from each. The difference between the first and second place paths from your abilities determines the cleric stigmata score, which grants certain abilities based on the score's rating in these paths. I do appreciate that neither path is labeled good or evil, just to focus on blessing, cursing, and general combat. Dread Knight, a Vanguard class, is highly offense-oriented, as you might expect, but your choice of build determines if that focus is going to be on outright damage or controlling effects. Moreover, several of their abilities allow for forced repositioning on the battlefield. And above all else, they can excel at being an anti-supernatural class. Oracles, a Sentinel class, are more akin to psionic characters in other fantasy games rather than a divine caster like in Pathfinder. While they can bring in a mix of offense and support, they lean more towards the former, especially since most of their abilities target mental defense instead of physical. Paladins are a champion class, with most of their abilities focusing on defense and counterattacks. While this is nothing new for paladins, I'd argue that the battle zone system helps paladins' abilities continue to be useful without hindering mobility. Rogues are a vanguard class in this case, but they're far more condition-based than other vanguards. It's odd that they're one of the primary ranged characters, but on the other hand, the battle zone system de-emphasizes the use of specific ranges in terms of how many feet or yards. It certainly fits the jack-of-all-trades motif that's common to this archetype. Sorcerers, another vanguard class, can fill the traditional wizard role based on their choice and abilities. While they have a potential tool for most situations, many of their offensive abilities are rooted in setting up their spellcasting for better results. The Umbral is a kind of supernatural assassin. This makes a lot of their offensive arsenal deal cold and spirit damage while trying to keep enemies off them through illusion and dirty tactics. The Visceral is akin to a shape-shifting druid that focuses on melee combat. The mixture of polymorph effects and feral techniques makes them an aggressive, high-risk class designed to continually put pressure on the enemy. Lastly, the Warrior is the game's answer to their traditional fighter, at least at first. 
Depending on the build, they can lean towards the Warlord class from 4th edition, since its support abilities are rooted in battlefield control and allowing your allies to utilize tactical advantages. A criticism of D&D 4th edition I recall hearing frequently was the lack of build options, a critique I feel fits 5th edition, but I digress. While Unchained Heroes attempts to answer this, its main issue is going to be in presentation. I think if abilities were better organized, it'd be easier to decipher what each class is aiming for. This ties into the mix of crunch and abstractions presented in the game. While this method of crunch is going to be a take-it-or-leave-it situation, the real deciding factor for some is going to be the RTC engine. I can see what it's going for in de-emphasizing initiative and focusing on time being a resource with your actions not being guaranteed. But this might be a little too crunchy and a little too tracky for some. I don't think it's a good or bad thing, but it's definitely going to be the thing that either makes or breaks your interest. However, once you've got the bases covered, I think it goes much smoother. And thus I would give this game a stamp of recommended. It's not quite the 4E-like game that I was sold as, but it has some of the similar DNA. I do see a lot of potential in this game for those who prefer not using elaborate combat maps, but still want a sense of tactics in their games. But this isn't the only game I've touched on that carries the DNA of D&D's most controversial edition, and we'll be delving into a few more of those in the future. Stay frosty!